Hello and welcome to another Cyberpunk Day exclusive interview. Um, I am Matthew A. Goodwin, an independent science fiction cyberpunk author, and today I am joined by Elias J. Hurst, who is one of the Cyberpunk Day co-founders, and Andrew McGee, who is the writer-director of Venus, a short cyberpunk film, which you've probably just watched and will watch again after this interview. But we wanted to take a moment to uh, chat with him about uh, Venus because it's such an, a wonderful movie. I was um, one of the early Kickstarter backers uh, back in the day just because I love the genre. And now I'm lucky enough to interview the filmmaker. So uh, thank you guys for joining me. Thank you. Yeah, happy to be here and uh, excited to have Andrew here. Yeah, absolutely. I think I want to start, since it is Cyberpunk Day, I think the best question to start with is, um, Andrew, what attracted you to Cyberpunk in the first place? I think it I think it was video games first, to be honest, before I saw Blade Runner or the classics <clears throat> playing Deus Ex and um, Mirror's Edge, uh, I suppose you can call that a bit Cyberpunk. Um, and yeah, from there, as, a, as I started getting into films and filmmaking, um, Absolutely, films like Blade Runner and Ghost in the Shell. Um, more broadly, sci-fi like um, Ex Machina. Um, even un Under the Skin was a quite a big inspiration for, for Venus as well. And I think they all have sort of cyberpunk roots and connections. Um, and, and books as well, of course, Neuromancer, um, the, the great works of sci-fi. Um, yeah, once I knew that cyberpunk was a thing, you know, as a show, it's not just more sci-fi, it's its own kind of genre in itself um yeah like all of us who are contributing today it's um there, there's 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 something about that world that um really engages you and and it's kind of enchanting as as its own form of sci-fi yeah absolutely and is there something about cyberpunk in particular that makes you that you feel makes it like perfect for storytelling uh, well, from a filmmaker's perspective, visually, um, you know, it has its own distinct look with the, the light and the darkness and the kind of um, urban landscapes. There's so much kind of storytelling potential there. I think it's it's a setting that lends itself to to uh, exciting stories so well. And also within that, you've got the um, power dynamics and, and, you know, haves and have nots and... Um, all that ties in with with the, the theme of humanity and so body augmentations and things. It's um, yeah, all, all these all these ideas and themes are so nicely interwoven just in in this uh, subgenre. Well, I think that's something you really managed to capture in even just the street where Iris finds herself. It is that perfect cyberpunk setting, and it it, it seems to it manages to speak volumes while not being super oppressive. Um, you, you've got the neon and you have the people walking by with the digital displays. I think you really, you nailed the aesthetic so much. And of course, when um, the mom is bringing her back in the first place, she's doing it in this warehouse that, but you have the drone floating outside. I mean, you just, you nail the aesthetic in the film, really. Oh, thank you. I was so excited when I, when I found that location, um, that alley, alleys like that don't really exist in the UK. I was searching online, <laughs> All the ones in London were unaffordable, um, you know, it would have cost us thousands to use it for a few hours at night. And then I found this, uh, yeah, it looks like a New York alley with the fire escapes and everything um, on the south coast of England by the by the sea. Um, yeah, we didn't have to do an awful lot to it production design wise to really give it that, that vibe. And Elias, did you have any questions you wanted to ask as well? Yeah, absolutely. I was kind of interested, you know, sort of where you were and what you were doing when you first had the idea for this film, Venus. Oh, I mean, like Matthew said, like it's been long enough for him to be able to say way back um, <laughs> when the first Kickstarter happened, which was mid 2019, I think, um, or even, even before that. So I think with every stage of production that has happened since then, kind of the original inspiration gets a bit faded each time. I think myself and my co-writer Tara um, wanted to sort of find a new angle on, on Cyberpunk because, you know, as much as we love all the, the tropes and characteristics, it hasn't changed an awful lot since since Blade Runner. Um, and yeah, we, we thought one angle is kind of 
there's so much to do with with the body and you know um, robots and kind of sexuality that um, is often sort of just window dressing and not explored fully. So we wanted to kind of get into that side, sort of seeing these very patriarchal worlds from a from a female perspective. I think that was the starting point. Um, well, the very first starting point was I want to make a cyberpunk film, um, <laughs> and just about when you succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I was writing it, it seemed just about possible, which is the area that I like to work in that uh, small margin. Very cool. It's, it's always interesting to you know kind of hear how ideas evolve over time because of course you you start out with something at the offset and then. It all changes. Sometimes it's logistical factors, like can I make this idea happen? And other times, just your preferences evolve as the project yeah, absolutely. is nearing completion. Yeah, and and a lot did change over the course of the script. Um, at one point, we we knew how Iris died and what happened there. Um, I think originally the hideout was kind of out in um, out in the countryside, kind of like a a rural hideout and then she had to kind of make her way over to the city but that didn't really make as much sense for it for a short um when i discovered like the, the interior location we use which was actually just next to the alley it all made sense to keep it contained in that kind of city space and it made everything a lot more made it flow a lot better what do you see as like the unique what i would say challenges and benefits of sort of a short film format versus something longer. I mean, you touched on, you know, you can't have these lengthy journeys from location to location, but what else? Um, I think, yeah, it has to, the, the idea behind the short was to make something that was self-contained, but could also act as a proof of concept for something bigger. And that was the plan from the beginning. So being able to create a world that has just about enough detail to intrigue you enough world building um along with a with characters that you can hopefully grow attached to in a very short space of time um and yeah it's it, it i don't i find dialogue difficult which is why there's not an awful lot of dialogue in the film but the the bonus of that is when it comes to sci-fi you want to keep thing you want to show don't tell as much as you can you want to create the world without having somebody dumping exposition all the time so that um that was useful from a, a writing standpoint to contain myself because now i've written a feature version and obviously there is a lot, a lot more dialogue um and you have to you have to be explaining and interacting in, in certain ways but i think it's good practice to um to have done the short and to try and keep that that mentality of of um yeah restricting dialogue as much as you can for sci-fi you did a really excellent job of making viewers want more the most common thing that i've heard from people who are watching venus is i'm ready for the two-hour version and <laughs> it, it is funny you do a good job of introducing like the the character who's walking down the street who is clearly the boss here but there's much more to that world, obviously. My wife last night said, oh, I feel like Iris's mom is definitely involved in something bigger here too. I wanna know more about that. So there's just, I can already tell there's all these branching storylines where you just want it all fleshed out. And um, I think that's what makes this short so excellent is that it just makes you want to dive into this world and get a taste for more of it. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that that's the, um that's the reception for most people because I was a bit concerned that it ends on a cliffhanger. People go, oh, come on, that's not satisfying. Um, <laughs> what a letdown. So the, the fact that it does get people hyped for more. Um, I mean, it's only sort of a cliffhanger because in a short time, you do have the journey of somebody discovering their own power, which yeah. is, I mean, credit to you. That is not easy to do, to go from what the hell is sticking out of my arms to, oh, I'm gonna use this, is is really difficult to do and you do it in a very short amount of time. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we were never going to see a drone a drone fight in this, that wasn't, you know, <laughs> so you needed a, a thematic ending, which is, uh, I think that's my favorite part of the film is the very ending because just her, like Margaret's look of determination as, as she's looking up sort of, looking at the first frame of the film with with um 
young Iris Phoebe, sort of completely innocent and, and, and oblivious. And then comparing that very first frame to that very last frame, um, I, I just love that, that character contrast. It's funny that that leads to one of my questions. I was going to ask, are there any moments, any performances that you're particularly happy with? It sounds like the cyclicality of the starting and the ending shots is one thing you're particularly proud of, but are there any performances or anything that really stands out to you? I mean, I'm sure you love most of it, but are there any moments that you just just obsess over? Oh, I mean, I had the, the easiest job I've ever had as a director in terms of directing because I, like the cast was just so fantastic. Um, but the funny thing is, throughout the film, characters aren't really interacting with each other. Like, um, Iris and Nia never really have a moment, moment of interaction. Either one of them is dead or digital or the other one's dead. Um, so the, the scene inside the booth um, where we have Lee and Margaret was um, the, the most enjoyable part to direct because finally there were two characters interacting um, without any big special effects or, or anything going on. It was just this really contained um spot that we had to work with <clears throat> so and um i feel like that was quite a fine line to balance in the editing between not making this you know um step over the line um which is what we were conscious of while we were filming that but yeah watching that bit back i'm i'm really proud of how they um how their interaction plays out and, and the beginning and the ending of that scene um and also the the scene where things start to go downhill for, for Nia, where the screen gets hacked and the drone comes up. I really like that um, that sequence. For me, uh, one of the smallest, it's a, such a small moment, but I, I always love small moments in movies, is I love when Iris first plugs in and she starts to like twirl her hair. Like the, the programming is such, before she overrides it, the programming is such that she's just turned into this sultry bot for a second. And I just think that that is, you know, the difference between filmmaking and sometimes like um, st literary storytelling is that you, you can't have those sort of visual moments that an audience can pick up on. You, you end up having to describe a thing, which, you know, of course has its own power, but with film, you have these moments that are just so uh, subtle, but if you pick up on them, so wonderful. So that, I don't know, that's a moment that really stood out uh, for me. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that moment. It hasn't been brought up before yet. So yeah, really pleased. It's a great example of, you know, the show don't tell aspect of sci-fi where you're, you're saying so much about this technology and these people and how it interfaces with bodies and minds with just that one little interaction, there's a lot packed into there, but you know, that's what makes it so cool. And those little details like that are what make the whole world in Venus so intriguing is there's lots of little open windows to explore later on and hence everyone demanding two hours more. <laughs> I'm very happy with the demand. <laughs> uh, so I do have to ask, since it's Cyberpunk Day, I'm curious, Andrew, are there uh, certain I, movies, I think, would be a, a good starting point, but are there is there any sort of um, necessary cyberpunk viewing for people out there who are sort of maybe uh, burgeoning fans? Oh, uh, I mean, I've covered the obvious ones, you know, Blade Runner, Ghost in the Shell. Um, i say Upgrade. Uh, I think that's a fantastic film. And also it was done on such a tiny budget. Like that was a point of reference in many ways. Also just in doing a lot with a little. That looks to me like a massive Hollywood film. Um, gosh, my mind's gone blank now. <laughs> I'm I mean, those are great recommendations, and Upgrade is also a great example. I mean, a testament to the editor, particularly in that movie, where they really the action is really tight, where it's oh, yeah. it's somehow closer to John Wick than a bunch of Hollywood movies, mm -hmm. where somehow the action still feels slow, still feels you know not as as vital. Upgrade somehow the action just feels like it's gonna punch you in the face. Yeah, and the way they use the camera movement as well, they've got that kind of tracking effect that on, on the body as it moves, that's kind of unlike anything I've really seen before. Yeah, I was about to do an impression of it and then realized that was not going to translate. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question I, I had that I'm, I'm wanting to ask, you know, of particularly cyberpunk creators, you know, I imagine there are some people who are, you know, um, writers or filmmakers who are looking to you for inspiration, is there any advice that you would give for, um, you know, aspiring cyberpunk creators? I mean, I think 
know know the limitations, know what you can pull off feasibly with, with what you have. Um, cyberpunk is unfortunately an expensive genre to pull off if if you know you go all out in the world. Um, so yeah, I think be smart with what you can achieve. Um, I'm trying to put myself in the position of you know uh, starting when I first started out on this on this project, um, yeah, and I always have a have a good team around you who um, you know elevate you and and who are um, skilled and experienced. That's yeah, I couldn't have pulled this off without all the people that I worked with who are just incredible, um, and also you know um, build up to where you feel comfortable as a filmmaker. Like I, I did a lot of student films at uni and in retrospect, they weren't great, but um, it was the process of making them as a filmmaker that they were also sci-fi and very low key sci-fi, but they sort of paved the way in um, knowing what can be achieved in, in that sense. Uh, I mean, we were really lucky with the, the Kickstarter to have such great budgets to work with, but even then everything was we were penny pinching thing it became a money sinkhole and everything was stretched as much as it could to go in front of of the camera that actually leads me very naturally to my next question which is going to be do you, like would you mind just talking us through the the creative process um of getting this movie from just uh you know an idea to now being this this beautiful film just a uh, couple yeah. steps right <laughs> <laughs> step one write it step two film it done Exactly. Oh, but you edit it and then it's done. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, the first step was the <clears throat> the Kickstarter. And at that point, we didn't have anything apart from an idea. I think what really helped was having concept art of the script, because when people are backing something, they need some kind of visual reference. Film is a visual medium. You can't just base it on the idea alone. So that was um, that was valuable. The, the month of the Kickstarter, I've sort of blanked out my mind at this point. It was it was tough, the whole, the whole marketing campaign. I was doing all that myself, social media, um, putting myself in front of the camera lens, which I'm not used to. I prefer to be behind the camera. It's getting easier now. Um, talking off the cuff like this would have been terrifying, you know, a year or two ago. Um, and yeah, from that first Kickstarter, we I had a core team together. Then it came to the whole casting process and we actually we filmed the lavender stuff mid 2019 in the summer because we needed the, the weather which wasn't a certainty being in england but we were lucky <laughs> and then we waited six months to film the rest of it at the end of november we got the rest of production in gear and that kind of thing um and then 2020 was basically a year of post-production and I, I i i took a bit longer i took my time with it because i didn't want to release it mid pandemic um i wanted us to have some in-person festivals as well so um yeah then after that year of, of a lot of vfx and color grading and, and all of this uh yeah the, we released it at the very beginning of, well we finished it at the very beginning of this year so in all it was about two years of of um process from the beginning of 2019 to the end of 2020 yeah, and can you tell us a little bit about this festival circuit? I mean, you are just all over the place now. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, we've had some some amazing acceptances. There was the LA Short Film Festival, which is kind of um, Oscar, BAFTA qualifying. They're not not for sci-fi films, so there's still a bit of I don't know a bit of snobbery going on there to genre filmmaking. But that was still really high profile. Another one, which is Fanta Festival, which has been going since. 1984, I think, it's had Vincent Price and these icons of horror uh, passed through it. Um, I, I'm guessing I haven't been able to travel abroad yet for, for any of them, um, but the, we've now had a few in the UK, which have been great to attend and finally um, see it in person. There was the Oxford Film Festival. Sci-Fi London is coming up next month, which is a really big one. And the best thing for me about seeing it on the big screen for the first time, I mean, um, I, I'd already seen it on a fairly big screen, but having the sound system in the cinema made all the difference. Like when the drone came up, I was like, oh, wow, that, <laughs> that sounds so cool. Um, yeah, so we, we, we've still got a few to hear back from. It's kind of a year long um, 
circuit. So, yeah, fingers crossed for, for a few more by the end of it. Do you still enjoy watching it? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I I think I haven't actually watched it much since since it was finished. The, the, the Oxford Fest, no, the Brighton Festival was the first live one. It had been a good four or so months, I think, between then and seeing it again. And I think it's the first film I've made where I'm not constantly criticizing myself. I'm, I'm, I actually, in, well, I don't know if I enjoy watching it because I'm still watching it kind of analytically and I've lost all my objectification of like, you know, watching it as a story. But um, yeah, I think it's more about the vibe if I'm watching it with an audience. I'm not, I wouldn't sit down on, on my computer and watch it, but having other people, the, the vibe of other people reacting to it is uh, special. Yeah, I think that's something hard, you know, for pretty much any type of creator is you spend all this time and effort and you can be so happy with it at the end, but then there gets to be a point where when you watch it, you just think of like, man, I could have done that a little different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you start uh, picking it apart. Yeah. There's always going to be something. Um, but yeah, this is, I have by far the fewest criticisms of it, uh, of myself than, than anything else I've made. Uh, that's, um, well, that's great. I was going to ask also, um, are there any questions or there, is there anything that you hope for an audience to take away, um, from the movie after having watched it? Oh, uh, well, apart from, I, I want to see more is, is always <laughs> a good one because that, that's the plan. Um, I just hope, I hope people have an emotional response to to the story and to Iris. I hope it's kind of a journey to go on. Um, somebody told me it was kind of, it was quite an intense and relentless film. And, you know, she does really go through a lot in that short space of time. So uh, I hope by the end of it, people will also feel a bit kind of exhausted and uh, <laughs> empathetic. Um, and also if, if it gets people thinking about, you know, the sci-fi ideas in it, um, transhumanism, that kind of thing. Um, then yeah, I would be, I'd be happy. Oh, that's great. And you had mentioned that you've uh, written the script for the feature length version um, without spoiling, of course, anything. What, um, what are you going to be exploring? What, what more are you going to be telling from this world and this story? So the first act of the feature is more or less the short film, but with a lot more detail going on. Um, so it, it, it does pick off, pick off at the point with the drone in the alley that, setup is still there. What happens from there is, um, where can I go with it? <laughs> it, it, it? It's still very much keeping the, um, the idea of a intimate character driven film, but on a, on a big scale. I'm being realistic with, you know, as a first time feature filmmaker, what kind of scale I'll be able to pull off. Um, much character driven and it also explores gender dynamics a lot more. Um, Nia, the mum, has a pretty uh, big role, and yeah, her, her outcome might be different than than the short. There's a lot of a kind of backstory and history in in this world. There, um, am I still am I still in the stream? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sorry, it frozen for me. Um, and yeah, and, and uh, there's a a villain role as well, which is, uh, you know, at the moment it's just kind of the drone, but there's the the big corporate villain who also has a history with both um, Nia and Iris. I mean, as you would expect. <laughs> and it'll, it'll be nice to get uh, Nia's story fleshed out a little bit too. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's such a hard thing, I think for any parent, especially their overlap of, of mom and daughter is, is death you know it's 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 sort of brutal i mean it's beautifully brutal but that's that's a hard pill so i guess it'll be it'll be nice to get her backstory a little bit too even if they still don't have any moments of overlap <laughs> just to get a little bit more of her because it is just such a tragic end yes she's accomplished what she what she wanted and she sacrifices herself but it is it, you know it's it's hard it's hard to to watch because you do want those two characters to have even just the one moment but because of the nature of the scene once Iris is there, she has to get the get out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it it, it is pretty much just as it's not particularly cheerful either as as an outcome. It's still bittersweet. 
in the feature, but um, we get a lot more of their their story. So in, in, in this version, the setup is that um, Nia and Iris are still on, on the run in hiding, but they built up a kind of community, which is in uh, kind of countryside rural um, in hiding, which is which was the original plan for the short. So we get a lot more of their kind of lives pre pre Iris's death and, and pre, you know, them being uh, really on the run. Well, I think that's great, too. It actually speaks to something you said earlier, which was doing something with cyberpunk that's a, a bit different, um, a bit unusual. Rural cyberpunk is not something we've we've seen all, of, <laughs> all that much. Um, it's nice to explore. I mean, you know, the city is what we know, but there would be lives elsewhere. And I think it's great, the idea of exploring some of those other locations. How does the technology interact there? I, I think that's a really ripe area for exploration. That, yeah, definitely. I, and I, I liked what Cyberpunk 2077 did with the Nomad storyline, which is, um, you know, in the in the desert and things. It, this I still like to keep uh, this set in kind of the UK, just because that's also a bit different um, uh, in, in Cyberpunk. And, you know, there's room there for kind of commentary on, on uh, on the UK and where where we're heading in the future, but um, yeah, I, I like I like the that juxtaposition of nature and urban, like we did in the short with the lavender field compared to like it's like natural neon and then uh, city neon uh, and also but there's levels there because it's actually simulation. It's a bit too perfect. So yeah, I really like playing with those, those ideas. Yeah, kind of launching off of that. Do you do you see Venus as a depiction of a future reality, or is it more a work of fiction? Oh, uh, I don't think we're very far off humanoid robots, um, and I think yeah, like ideas of of sex bots and that kind of thing is not um, at all out of the realms of possibility. I'm, I'm interested to know where that sort of um, side of humanity is heading and what that means for human connections as well because even now i think i don't i personally don't think the human brain was really designed for the internet and this sudden overload of information going on uh and i think it's impossible for us to imagine really where that's that's heading i think the future you know we couldn't have imagined what this future looks like 100 years ago and i think even 20 years ago it's such a different world so another 100 years in the future i I, I'd, I'd kind of like to go lean into the weirdness of, of the future. Um, yeah. But yeah, with, with certain elements, like I did that in the short with the, the cybernetic eyes and just the, the strangeness of what's going on there. Um, but yeah, I really like to kind of lean into to how odd our future is going to be while still keeping, you know, the, the balance there is keeping it relatable and, and human. Actually, that uh, a question I've been asking of a lot of creators um, this leads naturally into it, is, um, you know, cyberpunk often acts as sort of a cautionary tale about the nature of man's relationship with technology. Do you believe that technology might ultimately doom us, or are you more optimistic that we can harness this technology to sort of save us from ourselves? Oh, I, I, I think probably of the, the Black Mirror mindset that, you know, technology is never really the issue. It's, it's humans and how they use them, and especially how you know corporations that exploit people and tap into the addiction and the, the the rush you get with you know using certain bits of tech uh i i well i think i hope we survive climate change first and <laughs> we don't have to resort to um you know more more primitive means there uh, yeah, i hope i hope science and technology will be the the solution, but I think equally it requires human cooperation and um, internationally and on a, on a personal individual level. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm interested to be along for the ride of the next uh, few decades. Well, hopefully longer than a few. <laughs> <laughs> next yeah, I wonder if it always feels this way, but it, it does feel like we're right on the cusp of so many of these things in cyberpunk, uh, like artificial intelligence and transhumanism. And yeah, maybe people always feel that way, right? <laughs> but <laughs> maybe, but yeah, now, now yeah. It, kind of, it does feel more tangible. We can see the technology that can lead into that. Well, and technology is changing more in a year than 
it did in a thousand years, 2000 years ago. Yeah. Where yeah. when you blink, it's a new technology now. So a lot of the ideas of cyberpunk are becoming just ideas of our current reality. Mm. Yeah. Mostly with a less cool aesthetic. We've got, we've got the dystopian side. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right, Andrew, I guess I, I want to ask, so what's next and what can people do to support Venus to get, um, you know, to get this movie made? Yeah, so um, we'll be doing the festival circuit for the next few months. Uh, if you follow our social media, you'll be able to keep track of where it's, it's screening. If it's screening near you, then I absolutely recommend to go along, not just for Venus, but it's, it's always in a block of sci-fi shorts, which... Uh, always fantastic by you know amazing filmmakers uh so yeah in, in the short term um following what we're doing uh we should be releasing it publicly online at the beginning of next year uh on the dust youtube channel so that will um that'll be great that they have you know a, a massive audience and um really looking forward to seeing what what people online make of it so we'll be making a lot of noise when that comes out from from there we're already, you know, pursuing um, producers and studios uh, to to get this off the ground, find the funding, that kind of thing. So, uh, as much as much hype and attention and views as we can get, always uh, helps with that, and especially, you know, um, a, a good response to it. Uh, and yeah, if any if any big producers happen to, happen to be watching, then <laughs> give me a call. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining us for this. Thank you for letting us uh, show your movie and for the uh, premiere of the commentary. And um, we look forward to what what you have planned next. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me.